Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Members protest against lagging transition to Education Ministry. Former Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education, Dr. Grace McLean, has been interdicted. And later in sports, Reggae Boys face Peru this evening in Friendly International. I'm Shane Masters and here are the details. Teachers and staff members at the National Council on Technical and Vocational Education and Training NCTVET and Vocational Training Development Institute VTDI on Gordontown Road in St. Andrew are on strike. Or reporter Sander Williams was on location. Just like the morning sun, teachers and staff at the National Council on Technical and Vocational Education and Training, NCT VET on Garden Town Road in St. Andrew, were out in their numbers, protesting against what they claim is ill treatment from the government. Among their list of complaints is the transitioning process from the Hart NSGA Trust to the Ministry of Education. For the past three years, we have been transitioning. As a result of this, our contract workers cannot get longer than three-month contracts. You cannot carry a three-month contract to the bank to get a mortgage or a car loan. Similarly, persons can't even travel overseas in some instances because the embassy does not like to see short-term contract letters. At the same time, Hart has approved a new salary package for their workers, persons on their structure, but we are still being paid the old salary and still carrying out Hart Trust's mandate to train and certify persons. The Hart Trust, who is paying our salaries, so that they are not responsible for us, except for the salaries, so we have received no benefits. As my colleague said, we are at the same level as program coordinators, lecturers, and we are, not, we are getting lower pay than the rest of the Hart Trust persons. At the VTDI, our staff members must have a master's degree to be considered a lecturer and we are getting at a CXC teacher level. That's what we are getting. We are right now unable to attract any staff because of the pay and because of the uncertainty where we only have a three-month contract. So persons are not willing to come to the VTDI to work. Not even the scorching sun was enough to deter their determination for answers from the Ministry of Education. They are demanding a seat at the table with the Ministry. To have a meeting with the Ministry of Education executives, the Minister of Education and the Permanent Secretary. We have been promised meetings from as far back as October. They have met with the board but have not graced the staff with their presence via even our web meeting. So we are asking for a meeting with those persons. If not, we will continue our action until we are heard. Reporting from Garden Town Road in St. Andrew, I'm Sandy Williams for TVJ News. The health minister says he'll be focusing more on the wellness aspect of his portfolio this year, specifically targeting overseas and local voluntary support to improve primary health care in Jamaica. He was speaking at a ceremony yesterday to mark the adoption of the Riversdale Health Centre in rural St. Catherine. Krista Campbell reports. Ten health centers already adopted by Jamaican Consulate General in Miami, Florida, Oliver Mayer, and the 102-year-old Riversdale Clinic in rural St. Catherine is the first of three others to benefit from the Adopter Clinic program, which aims to improve resources at primary health care facilities. Health is a way of life. Each one of us have to ensure that in our own way, we take care of our health. We eat well, we exercise well, we ensure that we manage stress and we have fun and then defining a role for helping others who we can support and help and that's why i think the philanthropic exercise or the volunteerism has to become a more dominant feature of public health first helping people to help themselves and then helping people to coordinate around helping communities the adoption is funded by proceeds from an annual 5K run walk undertaken by the Jamaica High Five Group. One million dollars per year for three years. That will assist with not only the support of the renovation of the facilities, but also the purchase of needed clinical and office equipment as well as maintenance. 
The health minister encouraged the consulate general to treat the three-year adoption agreement like a regular adoption process of a child by providing frequent support where possible. And Dr. Christopher Tufton stressed that a little help goes a far way when resources are lacking as badly as they have been for years in Jamaica's healthcare system. If you don't have a functioning microwave, then it means that you can't heat up your lunch. You know how upset and disappointed a worker can be if they can't heat up them lunch when lunchtime comes and they have to be treating patients right through the day. It may be a refrigerator that's not working and you need a motor or you need a new fridge. You know how demotivating it is if you have to drink water and can't put a piece of ice in it or a chair to sit down on or a TV to occupy the time spent by the the people who are waiting. Krista Campbell, TVJ News. The climbing COVID hospitalizations and infections of health healthcare workers are now adding pressure to smaller public health facilities, and there's an increased challenge to find additional bed spaces. At the Port Maria Hospital in St. Mary, the senior medical officer says social cases are also adding to the pressure. Again, we go to Krista Campbell for this report. One of the smaller public health facilities on the island, the Port Maria Hospital in St. Mary, usually has fewer admissions than other hospitals. But as COVID cases climb among patients and hospital staff, like all other public hospitals, it's now operating under emergency mode. We are currently 100% on both our male and female adult medical wards. Uh, with regards to our accident and emergency department, um, which we have six bays, we currently have 10 patients. Um, with regards to maternity and, and the pediatric ward, we are currently doing well, but those are areas that we cannot repurpose for any, so for any numbers. Senior Medical Officer Dr. Sidney Powell says finding bed space is a challenge. We currently continue to treat mainly the complications from, from chronic um, illnesses, re or strokes from hypertension, um, diabetes, the renal failures, and of course trauma. We still continue to see a lot of trauma um, in, in this era. And the few social cases, that is patients who have been abandoned by their families at the hospital, also worsen the bed shortage crisis. We currently have about four or five of those persons uh, with us. And of course, um, we still have to continue to, to take care, not only of their um, comorbidities, but any, you know, just providing that, that social service um, that our social worker provides. He says he's awaiting the go-ahead from the government to move the social cases into an infirmary. But for now, because of the rapid spread of the Omicron variant, there's a hold on any patient transfer to such facilities. Krista Campbell, TBJ News. Clergyman Dr. Rowan Ambersley believes an action plan is needed at this time to help achieve the targets of Vision 2030. The pastor addressed the matter during the 40-second staging of the National Prayer Breakfast Thursday morning. I recommend a sustained and coordinated national development effort inspired by a passion for right action and an embracing of right attitude. This would support Vision 2030 with its lofty and commendable goals. I call it loving interventions for transformation lift. This would see national development partners coming together and agreeing on some specific actions to take if we're going to achieve our vision or get closer to Vision 2030. The National Prayer Breakfast was attended by leaders from multiple sectors, including the political directorate. And it's time for a break here on the Midday News. Stay with us. Much more stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. Former Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education, Dr. Grace McLean, has been interdicted. She was barred from returning to work until it's decided whether she will have to pay back some of the $124 million at the ministry that allegedly cannot be accounted for. Her attorney, Queen's Counsel Peter Champagny, confirmed this morning that 
Dr. McLean received a letter from the government late Wednesday advising her of the interdiction until Financial Secretary Darlene Morrison determines whether she will be surcharged. The notice to that effect was sent to her late yesterday afternoon and um, it is based on, as you have said, um, the substantial matter as it relates to the recommendation of a surcharge. And may I just add that that recommendation um, has been responded to in the way of a defense, and we are awaiting a formal uh, position on that. And if it's a case where it is going to be adverse to my clan, then we will be most definitely be seeking the intervention of the court at that juncture. When you say respond to Mr. Champagny said the remuneration terms of the interdiction are to be settled in the next five days, adding that Ms. McLean has insisted that the surcharge proceedings instituted against her are unwarranted. We have outlined in a very detailed letter why it is that um, certain things were, um, recommendations were made based on false premises. And it is therefore for them now to look at that. And I suspect that they will have to take some time to, in order to, to, to respond to us. Um, but when that time comes, and as I said, you know, if, if it is something that is adverse to us, then whatever recourse we have in law, we will certainly be utilized. You say recommendation are false. Now, Mr. Champagny was speaking with Radio Jamaica's hotline host, Emily Shields, this morning. The government is this afternoon insisting that plans are being put in place to reduce flooding in Montego Bay St. James. This comes after yesterday's tour of the city by Minister Without Portfolio with Responsibility for Works, Everett Warmington. For years, Montego Bay St. James has been plagued by flooding due to silt and garbage, which continue to block one of the major drains in the city, the North Gully. But Minister Without Portfolio with Responsibility for Works, Everett Warmington, says plans are in place to address the issue once and for all. This recommendation first was to cover it. What I don't that is best. So I ask that the technical team from the ministry be out here next week to look at it and give me a recommendation. Because so including the, in the old perimeter road is a study of the flooding in Montego Bay. Because for too often you get this flooding here. So part of it is to find ways to alleviate it. So it's not a part of the contract now. But before the project is completed, we expect to have a new contract of this study and design to include all the, the tributaries and the drains in Montego Bay, St. James. Residents and business operators in Montego Bay have been calling on the government to look at the problem. As they say, every time it rains heavily or for a prolonged period, they are stranded for hours. Minister Without Portfolio in the Office of the Prime Minister with special focus on the development of the Western region, Homer Davis, says he's happy that some attention is now being placed on the flooding problem. As someone who has served the city and has served it to the best of my ability, you know, now is the time that I see that Montego Bay would be getting its fair share of development. The thing is, we couldn't spend, we spent 274, 275 million US dollars to the perimeter roads, road, and then we leave these behind. So I've spent that massive stuff for that. We have to look at the other and, and correct it also. I'm very heartened, and I appreciate the fact that the government of the day has paid some amount of respect to the fact that we need to treat with the flooding in, in Montego Bay. And so the study that the minister spoke about is something that we welcome because you and I understand what Montego Bay is when it rains heavily. The men were speaking during a tour of St. James led by Mr. Warrington on Wednesday. And it's now time for the Business Minute. In the world of business, natural gas supplier New Fortress Energy NFE has changed direction on financing around its power plant at the Jamalco complex. Instead of a sale and leaseback arrangement through which the energy company was seeking $285 million to fund its expansion in other geographic markets, New Fortress will be raising debt by floating bonds on the capital market through subsidiary NFE South Power Holdings Limited while continuing to own the asset. 
Sajikor Group Jamaica Limited has already taken up 100 million US dollars, which represents about 35% of that investment. But instead of an equity stake in the power plant, the financial conglomerate now holds 100 million US dollars of bonds issued by NFE South. In business internationally, the U.S. boss who sparked outrage after sacking 900 staff in an online Zoom meeting has returned as the company's chief executive. Vaishal Garge took a break from his duties at mortgage startup Better.com in December after his handling of the affair drew widespread criticism. At the time, Mr. Garge apologized for his insensitive delivery but maintained the job cuts were necessary. And that's it for the Business Minute. And it's now time for the top regional and international stories. In news from the region, the Barbados Labour Party BLP was returned to government with a consecutive clean sweep of the 30 seats in Parliament on Wednesday. We want each and every one of us to thank the people of Barbados for the confidence that they continue to repose in us to be able to lead this country first to safety and then to prosperity. We are conscious as a political institution that there is still much to be done and that there is a road still to be traveled and that there are things that you as Barbadians are legitimately expecting of us. The mayor mortally led BLP1 in an election which was marred by complaints that thousands of COVID-positive citizens were denied a vote. The Eastern Caribbean island held a snap general election after cutting ties with Queen Elizabeth II last November and appointing its first ever president to lead the world's newest republic. On the international scene, India reported 317,532 new COVID-19 cases on Thursday surpassing the 300,000 mark for the first time in this recent wave. The last time cases surpassed this milestone was during the country's devastating second wave in April and May, which was fueled by the Delta variant. According to figures released on Thursday, the number of deaths rose by 491, bringing its total death toll to 487,693. And those were the top regional and international stories. And we head to a quick break. When we come back, Simon Preston will have your Midday Sports Report. Welcome back. It's now time for Midday Sports. I'm Simon Preston. Interim head coach of the Reggae Boys, Paul Hall, says he's looking for his team to play with urgency as they face Peru in a friendly international this evening in Lima. Peru are ranked 22nd in the world and 5th in South America, while Jamaica are 57th in the world and 5th in CONCACAF. Both teams are using this fixture to prepare for the upcoming World Cup qualifiers in CONMEBOL and CONCACAF, respectively. We want the players to move the ball quickly and for people to show that they should be in the squad next week for the World Cup. Now it's an opportunity for those players to show me and you know even show Jamaica who should be in that group of players who are being picked to try and see if we can win some games against Mexico, against Panama and Costa Rica. So this is a really good opportunity for those players to show me, you know, to knock on the door uh, and say I'm better than him, I'm better than him and really and that's why the, the, the squad, the final squad, hasn't been picked because I'm looking for something to come from this game to see who really, really wants it. The South Americans lead the head-to-head -head record over Jamaica with two wins and one draw in the previous three meetings. Live coverage of the match can be seen on TVJ Sports Network and heard on Hits 92 FM starting at 8 o'clock. TVJ will carry the match delayed at 9.35. Now, after recording a top 10 finish in 2021, Jamaica's Rugby Sevens team have once again been invited to the World Rugby Sevens Series Circuit, which kicks off on Friday in Malaga, Spain. This invitation will mark the Crocs' second appearance as a Tier 1 nation on the circuit. Captain Ashley Smith is looking forward to the challenge ahead. So we're truly humble and grateful for the opportunity. Thank you, World Rugby. Now, hats off to the management team for putting this all together literally in 24 hours. Um, it's going to be a challenge. We've got Argentina, USA, Spain, 
Uh, we're looking forward to representing our country, our family, our friends. Uh, we'll do our best. The Crocs will open the tournament at 7.56 on Friday morning against Argentina. The squad led by skipper Ashley Smith is completed by Gareth Stepani, Lucas Roy Smith, Omar Dixon, Tyler Bush, Rodri Adamson, Oscar Clayton, Jack Rampton, Cameron Melville, Tom Taylor Dawes, Chris McIntosh, Josh Jacquard, and Christian Squire. The last time the Crocs took the field in October, they won the 2021 edition of the Rugby America's North Sevens Championship. And that is it for your Midday Sports Report. I'm Simon Preston. Ashane, it's over to you. Thanks, Simon. And that's the Midday News. I'm Ashane Masters. Join us at 7 for primetime news. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.